Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming to my brown bag talk entitled The Imaginary History of Blockchains. So as you might have inferred from the title, uh, I will tell you today something about blockchains. Um, and the goal of my talk is to give you my personal impression of the basic technology and the basic properties of blockchains. So if you know already a lot about Bitcoin, Ethereum and so on and so forth, you might not hear a lot of new things. But um, if you don't know about these things, uh, I hope that you will learn about what I think are the most important qualities that all blockchains share. And I think it's then important if we think about what uh, problems can blockchain solve? It's good to think about it in terms of these important qualities, right? When you try to think about how can you solve a problem, then you often have many technologies that you could apply in principle, and then you need to think about which technology fits the problem well. So I think that's a good point of view to take with blockchains as well. Try to figure out what are the main important properties and uh, then how they can help us. So in this talk, you should learn about these uh, main uh, properties and you also saw in the title, it's the imaginary history of blockchain. So I will not tell you what actually happened, but I will tell you uh, something that didn't happen, but could or maybe should have happened uh, to come, so to, to make blockchains be invented as a technology. So without further ado, uh, let's get going. Uh, and of course, actually the story isn't completely imaginary. It did happen, but it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And fortunately, this galaxy has coffee houses and as many good things, also our story starts in a coffee house. And uh, here our three protagonists of the story meet. It's Alice, Bob and Carol, who are three students of computer science meeting after a hard day of lectures to discuss uh, topics in computer science and uh, computer engineering that they are interested in. So Alice starts off. Uh, this cloud computing stuff is pretty cool. You can just rent a virtual machine on the internet and execute a program there. You don't have to buy or maintain your own servers. Isn't that great? So Bob answers. Um, it's pretty cool indeed, but I'm not sure if I want to use these cloud computing services. I don't trust Amazon and Google. They are big corporations. I don't know anyone there. Who is to say that they run the program that I want to run on their cloud computing stuff uh, as intended, right? Maybe when I upload my program, uh, they, they modify it and it does something slightly different and I don't even notice it. Or maybe Amazon or Google, they just don't like me and they refuse to do business with me. Then I can't use their services at all. So Carol asks, well, why should they do that? So uh, Bob answers, uh, I don't know. I just don't trust these big corporations. By the way, I also trust, don't trust banks, right? They're big corporations as well. What if they just decide to take money out of my account? Well, Bob, personally for me, if that would happen, I would just call them and I guess I'd get my money back. But okay, well, let's consider uh, that we don't want to trust big cloud computing corporations. We don't want to trust the banks. What could we do? Well, how about the following? How about we build a virtual machine on the internet, but it's decentralized? It's a big network of nodes that's operated by random people, and we build it in such a way that you don't have to trust anyone individually to run your program correctly. You only have to trust, let's say, that most of the people that run the virtual machine are honest. And if you have that, you could even build a banking program on that decentralized virtual computer. So you would have a bank where you don't trust any individual uh, company or person. Okay, that sounds cool, but how would it work? So with that, uh, our friends leave the coffee house again uh, and they think hard about how could such a decentralized virtual computer be built technically. And one week later, they meet again in the same coffee house to talk about it. Alice goes, I figured it out. Our virtual machine will be based on a peer-to-peer -peer network. When someone wants to execute a program on the network, they submit a request to any node and it distributes it to the rest of the network, like in any peer-to-peer -peer network. And then all nodes run the program that was requested. It would look like this. 
So someone submits a request to our network, which consists of three nodes, and the request asks, please virtual uh, decentralized computer compute what is one plus two. So they would submit it to a random node, let's say node one, node one distributes it in the network, and then all these nodes would compute the answer to the question. So they all know how to calculate the plus function, and all the nodes would realize, well, one plus two, that's three, and now Bob could ask any node in the network, what is the result of my computation request? And now he would know uh, the result is three. Okay, goes Bob, but what if some nodes are cheating and produce wrong output? How do I determine which output is correct? So going back to our picture, that may indeed happen, right? We have three nodes. Let's say nodes one and two are honest. They really compute that one plus two is three, but node three wants to cheat Bob. So it computes one plus two is actually equal to four. Now, if Bob were to ask this cheating node, what is the result of one plus two? He would think it's four, so that's a problem. So Alice goes, well, that's the tricky part. After running the program, each node will need to solve a problem that can only be solved by guessing. And now the network will consider the output of the node that solves this guessing problem first as the correct one. That way, we somehow randomly choose which node um, is able to answer the computation request, and thereby we should prevent cheating because the cheating node may not be picked randomly. Okay, Alice, that's an intriguing idea, but what if someone just runs a million nodes on the network? Then it will be very likely that one of these nodes will solve this guessing problem that you have in mind. And then it becomes very likely that if these million nodes are cheating, that I will also be cheated by a decentralized virtual computer. Well, Bob, the guessing problem I have in mind is hard to solve. In particular, it will require a lot of processing power. So to make a million nodes, you will need to buy and run a ton of computers. And well, that just seems unlikely to me. So let's have a look at the guessing problem that Alice has in mind. So the idea is that when a node receives a computation request, like one plus two, is, uh, one plus two and it computes the output three, then as a next step, it tries to solve a problem based on a one-way hash function. So the node tries to find a value x, such that if you concatenate x plus the computation request plus the answer, and you compute the hash of this concatenation, then the guessing problem is solved correctly if the hash has some property. For example, the hash starts with two zeros. So because we know cryptographic one-way hash functions are hard to invert, uh, it's very hard to say, I want a hash with two zeros at the beginning, find me the x, right? So the best way that we know to solve this problem is really to just guess the x, compute the hash, check if it starts with two zeros, and if not, guess another x and do it again. So it's really a guessing problem that requires a lot of computational power. All right, goes Bob, but still, what if the cheating node is lucky and solves the guessing problem first? So let's go again to our picture and indeed, we have the setup, Bob asks the question, and now Bob believes the node that answers the guessing problem correctly first, and indeed, in our case, cheating node three was by luck and chance able to solve the guessing problem first. So Bob now believes that one plus two is four, which again is kind of bad. Alice recognizes that, and she goes, well, that's right. Well, how about the following? How about we extend our scheme and now we chain outputs of our virtual computer together. What I mean is, when a node computes the output of a computation request and solves the guessing problem, then it chains this result to the previous output, again, using cryptographic one-way hash functions. That way, I guess, we get a chain of outputs, and now we can make the following rule. We say that each node on the network, it should consider the longest chain as the correct one. We will see in a minute why I think that's good. And then we make another rule. So now nodes consider the longest chain as the correct one, and users of our network, we tell them, well, 
to make your to, to see the results of your computation, you should wait a bit. Wait until, let's say, four other results have been chained to your results, and only then believe what the network tells you. So now it looks as follows. So we consider a bit of a change network now for sake of the argument. So again, we have three no uh, four nodes, an additional node this time. We have nodes one and two as before. They do the same thing. They compute one plus two equals three and they are honest. Again, node three is cheating. It computes one plus two, but it says that it's four. And now we assume we have another node, node four. And node four, um, it runs a different uh, version of our, of our uh, virtual machine and it doesn't know how to compute plus. So it still wants to participate in the network, but it doesn't know how to compute plus. It needs to believe what the other nodes compute and will maybe react to some other computation requests. Maybe it knows how to compute minus, but not plus. So it would do that and for plus it just believes the others. So as before, we assume that our cheating node solves the guessing problem first and it distributes this result uh, throughout the network. So now nodes one and two, they know how to compute plus, so they know that node three is cheating, so they don't believe it, and they don't, uh, they don't take over this solution one plus two is four. They stick with their own. But for node four, node four doesn't know how to compute plus, and node three solved the guessing problem first, so now node four believes as well, one plus two equals four, and our network now has two different beliefs. One part of the network believes one plus two is three and the other one plus two is four. So let's assume that another computation request comes in. Let's say Carol asks the network, for me, please compute two plus five. And it uh, sends this request to the network, it gets distributed. And now assume the following. Um, again, nodes one and two compute correctly because they are honest and they chain this output to the output they previously computed. Now again, node three cheats and node three says, well, two plus five, that's four as well. But now assume that node one solved the guessing problem correctly first. It solved the guessing problem, it distributes its chain of result, so both the previous result and this one. And now node three disregards this result, it's cheating anyway, it wants to stick with its cheating. But now node four, which previously believed node three, now sees, well, now this, this chain of length two of two results, that's the longest one. So I start believing that, and you see our network repaired itself. Now only the cheating node believes that two plus five is four, and node four has taken over the two correct results by the honest nodes. So now when Bob goes to the network and asks, uh, what is the answer to my uh, computation request one plus two, um, if it asks a random node, the chance will be three-fourths that it will receive the correct answer. So if it asks a lot of nodes and takes the one which is most uh, prevalent, then it will have received the correct answer. All right, goes Bob. Well, I guess with this scheme, then the cheating node would be extremely lucky to guess correctly a lot of times in a row. Well, that sounds good enough for me. So again, happy that uh, they came up with a good scheme for their distributed virtual machine. Our three protagonists go about their lives and again meet one week later at the same coffee house. So now Bob starts. Well, Alice, I thought about your proposal and technically it sounds great, but I ran the numbers and solving this guessing problem, it really takes a lot of energy. How will I pay my electricity bill if I run a node on your network? Carol says, well, that's right. Hmm. I guess usually with cloud computing, you just pay the computing operator. But now we have a network of many individuals. Um, who do you wire your money to? Hmm. How would that work? So uh, Alice goes, well, I've got an idea. How about the following? How about we introduce to our distributed virtual machine a notion of coupon? And let's, let's make the following rules. Each network operator, so each, each individual that runs one of the nodes of our network, it receives some coupons. And then we make the rule that whenever a user wants a computation to be run, it has to pay for it with a coupon. And then network operators could sell their coupons to users for real money and use that money to pay the electricity bill 
while the users can use the coupons to perform the computation on the network. Carol goes, well, that's intriguing, but how would that work exactly? Okay, well, remember, a node has to solve a guessing problem after computing a program. Let's make the following concrete rules. When a node solves the guessing problem, it receives 10 coupons. Nine of these coupons, the node may just create out of thin air. And one of the coupons is taken from the user that submitted this computation request. In that way, the user needs to pay one coupon and we have a way to actually create these coupons. Namely, we just make them appear. It's just bits after all, right? So Bob goes, okay, interesting. Well, that could work, but where do we store who owns how many coupons? Well, Bob, now that's easy. We anyway need to store all the outputs of our virtual computer on this chain of results. So why not just store the coupon balances together with the outputs of our program? And furthermore, we can use public key cryptography to ensure that users can only spend coupons that they own. So we'll make it so that every, um, every wallet on our network that contains the coupons, it has a public and a private key, and the private key is used to sign uh, so that we can verify that really we should transfer coupons uh, from one account to the node operator. So how does that look now? Um, so let's uh, again go to our picture and now um, instead of having computation results, let's say we already have uh, an account balance uh, as a result on our blockchain. So node one, two, and three, they all know that Bob, for some reason, Bob has 10 coupons. So now Bob submits a request again to compute one plus two, but now he has to pay it with one of his coupons. The blockchain works as before, but now the result is a bit different. Uh, on the, the, the result is now not only the computation request plus its result, but also a, an account rebalancing. Bob um, is deducted one coupon, right? Because he has to pay for his computation request. And node two, which solved the guessing problem, it may just wire 10 coupons to its account. One taken from Bob and nine just created because that's the rules of the network. And again, um, the, this result is distributed and because it's the longest chain, all other nodes in the network which are honest uh, simply take over this result. So Bob goes, okay, I can almost believe that this will work, but now only node operators have coupons. How can someone who does not run a node but simply wants to use our virtual computer participate in what we have? Well, Bob, didn't you listen? Uh, uh, that's easy. We just uh, make it so that node operators can sell their coupons for real money. And to make that happen, we just extend our virtual computer, right? It can compute programs. So let's just put a program on this decentralized virtual computer that allows users to transfer coupons to each other. So that would look as follows. So now again, let's go to a network of nodes. Again, Bob has 10 coupons in his account. And now Carol also has an account on our network and she has zero coupons. And now we have this program on our network that allows us to transfer coupons. So instead of submitting a computation request, this time Bob submits a request to transfer three coupons from his account to Carol's account. And the blockchain works exactly as before with the computation request. Um, again, Bob has to pay one coupon for his request to be honored. So Bob transfers three coupons, he pays one, his account balance is now six, Carol receives three coupons, and the node that solved the guessing problem for this request first, it again gets 10 coupons, one from Bob, and nine just created. And everything else happens exactly as before. The results are distributed and another nodes take it over. All right. So, uh, our friends are happy. They think it's a well thought out thing. You, can, you have a decentralized computer. It's run by many people. You don't have to trust any individual. Uh, people get paid for providing their node operation services to the network. Uh, users can use it without running a node. They can buy a coupon from a node operator. Uh, everything's fine and dandy. Uh, and 
um, since everything seems to be set up nicely, it's just in time because a week later a computer science conference takes place. So uh, instead of going to the coffee house, this time Bob goes to the computer science conference eager to talk about uh, Alice, Bob and Carol's new invention. So Bob arrives at the computer science conference and Bob meets his old friend David. So Bob goes, hey David, what's up? We built a cool virtual machine where you can run programs without having to trust any particular organization. So if you don't trust the people who provide cloud computing services, you can just come to us and we do computation for you. You don't have to own a server and you don't have to trust anyone. Isn't that great? So David's of course excited. Well, that sounds cool. Uh, so how does it work? How can I run a program on that? Bob, happy that they discussed this before. Easy. Um, David, I can sell you a coupon for, let's say, one euro. And with this coupon, uh, you can submit a computation request and our virtual machine will compute any program uh, that we support. Ah, okay, so that's interesting. Uh, so what programs do you actually support? So Bob, hmm, he remembers they didn't really think about that in the coffee house. Well, let's just say the truth. Well, David, currently there's only one program you can send coupons to another user on the network. So now David replies with a, a blank and confused look and the curtain falls uh, on our story about the imaginary history of Bitcoin. So I hope uh, you enjoyed it so far. Um, I think the end uh, ties back to a bit what, what I said earlier, right? So I think, I hope you agree that the uh, technology on which blockchains are based is quite interesting and it brings something new to the table. Uh, but in my personal opinion, there's uh, still, of course, uh, the problem of finding uh, the real life problem where the blockchains are really a good solution. Uh, I guess you see this when you uh, watch the news a bit uh, and, and look at what's being done with blockchains. Um, the, the, um, I would say that the big thing that uh, catapults blockchains where you say this is exactly the problem where blockchains uh, can help us move forward. In my mind, it has not been found yet, but I think the jury is not over and uh, the, the jury is not out on that. So there's still, uh, the technology is still there. It's interesting. And I hope this talk gives you some um, mental uh, arsenal, so to speak, to talk, uh, to think about uh, whether some problem you see in the real world uh, can be solved in a good way by blockchains. So still, uh, I, I hope that um, the, the talk gives you some, some mental structure to think about whether blockchains are a good solution to some problem or not. Um, so let me maybe close uh, with a summary. So what I hope to have shown you is that blockchains are essentially decentralized virtual computers. And decentralization here means most importantly that trust assumptions are uh, less than with usual computing. There is no single server operator that you have to trust to do things correctly, to not cheat you, but there are other trust assumptions. For example, for the Bitcoin network, as long as 51% of the nodes are trustworthy and not cheating, the probability that it does the right thing is extremely high. And to get this, to get this uh, decentralized virtual computers with little trust, you have to have some notion of distributed randomness. So it's also an interesting problem and uh, in, in the talk we've seen this distributed randomness with the guessing problem where the randomness is ensured simply because we do not know in advance who will solve the guessing problem. It seems equally likely that each node in the network will be able to solve this. So you get distributed randomness from that. And in the end, uh, you have to figure out how people who run this network get paid and that was this notion of coupons we had in our story. So let me quickly tie this back to the real world. Many of you have probably already uh, thought how, how this matches up, right? So for example, if we take the two most popular uh, blockchains, that's of course Bitcoin, um, there are the coupon that we've talked about, that's just Bitcoins, BTCs. The guessing problem is called proof of work. So you prove that you did a lot of computation uh, by solving this guessing problem. And Bitcoin really only essentially supports one program, which is send Bitcoins from my wallet to some other wallet. But if you look at uh, the, another blockchain, Ethereum, 
there we have some uh, kind of the same structure. There's also coupons. These are the Ether tokens of the Ethereum blockchain. The Ethereum blockchain also uses proof of work as a distributed randomness mechanism. But now the Ethereum blockchain supports more programs. They're called smart contracts there. And in principle, you can, it has a Turing complete programming language. You can in principle put any kind of program you want onto this blockchain. So that's where uh, this whole idea of having a decentralized virtual computer really started. It doesn't hold for Bitcoin, but really for, for most modern blockchains, it's really the case that you can run arbitrary programs on this decentralized virtual computer. Uh, so finally, Ethereum is uh, planning to upgrade uh, its uh, central blockchain technology. And from our perspective of this talk, some things will stay the same. The coupons will st still be Ether, like in the first version. You will still have a Turing complete programming language to execute smart contracts on the blockchain. But it's moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, so that can be seen as a very good thing to try, because as we discussed proof of work, uh, you really have to use a lot of processing power. So you may know, you cannot say it exactly, but there are estimates Bitcoin seems to use really a lot of power for all of this hashing. And proof of stake now has the big advantage that it manages to do uh, distributed randomness without having these huge power requirements uh, using a different scheme. So also there you have to figure out a way. Um, you need some kind of resource that you have to put on the table with proof of work, it's computing power. With proof of stake, in Ethereum's case, it's Ether tokens actually. You have to have some resource to participate in this randomness to make sure that people just, just can just spam the network uh, to try to make it so that their cheating nodes will be picked in a more likely way. But I won't go into proof of stake here in more detail because actually um, this slide finishes my talk. So I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, I hope you learned some new things and thank you very much for your attention.